Okay. Thank you, Yasmin, for the in, uh, invitation to uh, discuss my uh, book, small book or large pamphlet, Revolutionary Strategy. Um, the book was published in 2008 on the basis of a, a weekly worker series written in 2006, which it itself responded to a debate uh, in the French uh, Trotskyist League Communiste Revolutionnaire uh, and uh, the intervention of Alex Kalinikos of the British Socialist Workers' Party uh, in that debate in the French League. So the book is essentially effectively now 18 years old. Uh, it was written before the financial crisis of 2008, though, um, as you can see from pages five to six, uh, I was expecting something of the sort to happen, but being rather cautious about that because Marxists have notoriously, uh, the joke is Marxists have predicted 10 of the last two financial crises. Um, uh, <clears throat> the basic political judgments of the book, in my view, have tended to be confirmed since 2008. First, uh, that uh, the underlying dynamic is towards uh, the ascendancy of nationalist, patriarchalist and authoritarian uh, tendencies. In this sense, the Islamic uh, Republic after 1979 was a harbinger of uh, what was going to be uh, the new normal um, with uh, Put the Putin administration, the Hindutva regime in uh, uh, India, uh, the emergence of various sorts of right populists, uh, post-fascists, uh, uh, Orban in Hungary, and so on and so on. Um, secondly, uh, left coalition governments have served in reality as a mere antechamber to further right governments. In the book, I talked about there being a, uh, well, there was at the time, talked about a pink tide in Latin America, but in reality, the pink tide has receded. And the most spectacular example, of course, is Argentina, uh, where the um, uh, left support for the Peronists as the lesser evil has wound up with uh, the uh, uh, victory of the far rightist uh, uh, Millet. Um, <clears throat> Thirdly, street and strike movements, uh, mass street and strike movements have, if anything, been weaker in their outcomes than those of the late 1960s uh, through 1979, which I think probably the last, again, is the Iranian uh, revolution of 1979, perhaps to some extent the Nicaraguan revolution of the same year. Uh, that's those two mark the end of a story. Um, there's been a good deal of quote color revolutions, meaning uh, street movements uh, actually directed by U United States covert ops, of which the Euromaidan in uh, um, uh, uh, Kiev in Ukraine was uh, in the 2014 was one. Uh, there have been similar movements in uh, Sri Lanka, in um, uh, Georgia. There's been something of a tendency for the street and strikist left to mistake these US directed operations, which quite often involve quite small forces for uh, uh, genuine revolutionary movements. Uh, the Arab Spring of 2011 clearly had an element of that present in it that the United States at first was willing to jump on and promote and so on. Uh, but uh, that went much further and that displayed, in a sense, the, 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 the real possibilities of uh, mass movements, but also the real limits, because at the end of the day, um, the uh, movements were captured by the Islamists who were the existing organized forces in the societies, whereas the left, having discredited itself, having by its alliance with the secular nationalists, having um, wound up with uh, negligible organized forces, was unable, in effect, to uh, take those movements and lead them in a uh, uh, seriously progressive direction. OK, so then the fundamental point of the book 
uh, is to try and escape from the closed choice which characterized the debate in the um, uh, French League and actually characterizes the left as a whole between, on the one hand, uh, the advocacy of uh, votes for um, lesser evil, broad left coalition politics, coalition governments. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, the only alternative to that is the rejection of electoral politics altogether and street and strikeism. Um, um, and the way in which the book approaches the question is to uh, look back at the history of the workers' movement and its uh, strategic ideas, um, uh, beginning at the beginning with Marxism as such, as a uh, uh, a uh, political strategy, as the, the political lines of the, quote, Marx party, um, uh, which one can see uh, in the debates of the 1870s and 1880s, um, and uh, from there onwards. Mm. So the first step, Marxism as such, uh, the basic idea of Marxism as, as a politics as such, uh, is uh, the emancipation of the working class as a class is the emancipation of all of humanity without regard to race or sex. Mm. So the, the emancipation of the working class is a central aspect. Um, the, and, and in that sense, the, the, Marxist, the Marx tendency was characterized by uh, commitment to the real, real existent, the real existing workers' movement as such, warts and all, the British trade union movement, uh, which participated in the First International, the French Proudhonist uh, anarchist uh, workers' movement, which participated in the First International, uh, and uh, so on. And um, Lasley has written about the quote, merger formula uh, this is talking about the Second International, but the idea of the merger between uh, this actual existing workers' movement of trade unions, cooperatives, proto-political parties, mutual uh, uh, and uh, workers' education organisations and all of this stuff, and the idea of socialism or communism, the point being uh, that actually, on the one hand, um, uh, the idea of socialism without the workers' movement is uh, without force, uh, because it has it it is merely an empty idea floating in the stratosphere and the production of a whole series of um, uh, utopian socialist uh, group of schools uh, of one sort and another. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the idea of the workers' movement without the perspective of going beyond capitalism. The consequence is that uh, the workers' movement is dragged in behind to serve as a uh, political tail end uh, for one or another wing of the capitalist class, whether it's the um, authoritarian, nationalist, patriarchalist wing of the capitalist class, which the workers' movement has been um, drawn uh, to support in various different forms at different times, or whether it's, as is more commonly the case, the workers' movement being drawn in to support the liberal free marketeering uh, wing of the capitalist class. So the, the merger of the actual existing workers' movement of the underlying tendency to develop the workers' movement with um, the uh, 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 so the socialist or communist objective of going beyond um, uh, capitalism. And uh, the book uh, contains uh, two fundamental points about this. The first is that the working class is not defined by its presence in industry or even by its presence in employment. The working class as a class is the whole social class men, women, children, um, aged parents being supported by uh, their juniors who are dependent on uh, the wage and the social wage. 
Yeah. And it's the fact that the working class doesn't have control of the means of production, which forces the working class as a class to organize collectively. And it's the fact that that being forced to organize collectively, which I've referred to already, the warts and all workers movement, which projects the possibility that cooperative collaboration, that uh, uh, the cooperative commonwealth may be the future which lies beyond uh, capitalism. Possibility. It's not, not, none of this is a certainty, it's a possibility. And in the book, I argue against um, both the various forms of populism as an alternative to uh, the perspective of uh, workers' power and socialism, and also against um, the uh, idea of the movement of movements, the idea that the workers, the oppression of workers is one thing which sits alongside the oppression of women, which is a separate thing, which sits alongside the oppression of lesbians and gay men, which is a separate thing, which sits alongside the oppression of indigenous people, which is a separate thing, and so on and so forth. So that uh, uh, against um, also the Hobbesbaum forward march of labor halted the argument that the workers movement by when we see and we certainly have seen massive decline in trade union organizing density since the 1970s but the reality is that the high organizing density of trade unions in the period between the 1950s and the 1970s was an artifact of the United States' policy of containment of communism. And that policy of containment of communism involved making the capitalist regime look more attractive to the working class in order to um, uh, uh, keep, in particular, the frontline states in Europe, Japan, um, and elsewhere. Um, and in order to do that, therefore, the uh, United States uh, allowed the acceptance of uh, managed trade policies and uh, exchange control mechanisms, financial repression, which in turn allowed uh, uh, high levels of strength to the working class. That policy ran out of steam, ran about 1970, and uh, became unpicked, starting with uh, Nixon's um, break with the uh, Bretton Woods uh, Exchange, foreign exchange system uh, in 1971, uh, but more sharply with Jimmy Carter's turn to human rights and uh, Spigny Brzezinski as uh, uh, national security advisor, policy of rollback, active promotion of um, the uh, Mojahedin in Afghanistan. This is before the Soviet intervention, the United States started actively promoting the Mojahedin in Afghanistan. More generally, the turn of shifting of US funds from right social democrats, where they'd been in the 1950s through 1970s, to um, uh, neoliberals um, and a whole load of other operations of one sort and another. OK, so that then the consequence is actually what we get is a capitalism which looks more like the capitalism of the uh, late 19th century, in which class, the question of class is posed not in terms of these enormously strong, centrally organized um, uh, trade unions in uh, uh, very large factories, but in terms of uh, intense precarity, uh, small workplaces, uh, and in which in consequence, the uh, working class needs needs more uh, to organize itself outside the factory as well as within the factory and uh, uh, so on and so on. OK. Um, I add, after the book has come out, there's an additional issue which has been posed, which has been very clear um, in the recent, particularly in the recent United States, but also elsewhere, which is that the left abandoning the idea of the saliency of class hasn't resulted in class ceasing to be salient in politics, but that the saliency of class can be appropriated by the right, as happened in uh, the United States with uh, the Trump 
campaign in 2016, vote Clinton, get Trump, and in uh, the UK with the uh, Brexit uh, operation. Um, and uh, uh, okay, so the saliency of class, I'm emphasizing all this stuff because uh, it, it, I spent more time than I meant to perhaps on this particular point, because I think this point is pretty much fundamental uh, to uh, everything else. Secondly, taking starting with the, uh, the, the, the Marx perspective, we get um, the rise of the German socialists. Part, Social Democratic Party and uh, the development from the late 1880s of the Second International and uh, three tendencies in the Second International. Uh, the coalitionists uh, who are also who are, who are advocates essentially of the working workers movement entering into coalition with uh, liberals of one sort and another. Yeah. Uh, who are also actually characterized by being soft on imperialism. So that the uh, the Bernstein debate, I didn't discuss this in the book, but the uh, debate on imperialism and the debate on revisionism in the German party start at the same point in time. And the way in which they start is uh, through uh, Eduard Bernstein arguing that uh, the German Socialist Party should support humanitarian military intervention against Turkey in order to protect the Armenians who are more civilized than the uh, uh, Muslim Turks. Um, uh, they're more civilized because they're Christians, I must admit. What? Um, and the polemic against that by uh, Ernest Belfort Bax, uh, which uh, argue, about Bax arguing what became the Leninist theory of imperialism as the product of uh, overproduction in the capitalist centers and so on and so forth. But the, 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 the coalition policy was already there, but the, 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 the coalition, the, 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 this debate, uh, it's also true uh, in the debates in the um, early uh, in the Second International in the early 1900s, that the guys who are advocates of entering into coalition governments with capital are commonly also advocates of uh, support for, quote, socialist colonial policy and other such atrocities. Um, so the, colon the coalitionists, um, are, secondly, on the left, the mass strikist left, um, I said in the book, I flagged that with the name of Rosa Luxemburg, but in reality, Rosa Luxemburg is is not the um, central leader. The, 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 the central line of the mass strikist left is of Georges Sorel, who was a yeah, syndicalist, revolutionary syndicalist in France, um, but equally of uh, uh, Arturo Labriola and uh, Benito Mussolini, who were advocates of uh, mass strikeism in uh, the Italian Socialist Party. Uh, uh, Luxembourg's position is, is closer to that of the centre. Uh, and the third tendency is the centre, or they call themselves orthodox Marxists. Um, I made too much in the book, I made too much use of Kautsky as a label for that center. The policy is actually a policy constructed by uh, Wilhelm Liebknecht and August Babel uh, in the 1870s through 1880s, and uh, with partial backing from Friedrich Engels uh, from the 1880s and down to his death. Um, and Kautsky, uh, Kautsky essentially was Babel's hitman to write uh, theoretical articles in support of a strategy, which was essentially Babel's uh, strategy. Um, now, I argue that the Bolsheviks, and indeed not just the Bolsheviks, but the mass communist parties of the post-war period, uh, the French Communist Party, the German Communist Party, the Czech Communist Party, the Bulgarian Communist Party, um, of the beginning of the of the early Third International, 
came out of this center tendency. They didn't come out of the, the coalitionist right. That was straightforward. Um, uh, the left, on the one hand, produced unorganized trends. So this is true of uh, the Italians uh, and equally of the German left, that there was unorganized left general strikist, mass strikist trend in, in the German party, or alternatively, they produced sects and uh, the SDKPIL of uh, Rosa Luxemburg was a plain bureaucratic centralist sect of the sort modern far left organizations have uh, uh, exactly the same character, Rosa Luxemburg, Leo Giorgiches, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, similarly, in the United States and in Britain, there was Delayanist socialist labor parties, which were plain bureaucratic centralist sects. They were distinguished by the fact that since they thought that the nature of the revolution had to take the form of general strike, the consequence was that the party needed to have organizational control of the trade unions. And since the party needed to have organizational control of the trade unions in order to direct the general strike, the result, in fact, was that the trade unions refused to be accept this direction from the party. And the party winds up being a, a grouplet with its own attached trade unions. Um, uh, so the centre, the difference essentially is that the 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 the, the, the centre tendency, uh, other guys who um, actually succeed in building broad mass workers' parties with mass with with the uh, mass organisations attached and clustered around them, uh, while the right wing is essentially parasitic on these to the extent that they aren't uh, merely. Uh, players in the capitalist parliamentary game um, and the left just either fails to build organizations at all or alternatively builds uh, sects but at the same time the center failed to uh, grasp uh, the uh, question of the state surprising as it may seem actually the socialist party of america is actually better on um, in terms of the political positions that it fights for, is better on um, uh, the uh, extent of capitalist rule through the judicial power, the extent of capitalist rule through undemocratic institutions like the United States Senate, through unamendable constitutions and so on and so forth. So the, uh, the SP, Amer Socialist Party of America, from that point of view, is somewhat better than the, the other parties but nonetheless uh, secondly they frame everything uh, in terms of national a succession of national revolutions and the problem is that actually it doesn't work because um e e e the clearest example well there's a failure in 1914 because large part of the center as well as significant part of most of the right and a significant part of the left uh, becomes uh, social defences, German defences in Germany, British defences in Britain, uh, French defences in France, etc, etc, etc. Secondly, Karl Kautsky uh, in 1917 um, he Kaut, Kaut, Kautsky are, made the most explicit argument for national roads that essentially uh, the um, national socialism in single country and national roads, national self-determination is fundamental. Uh, already in 1905-6, 7 sorry. Um, but in 1917, uh, he publishes two pamphlets which are untranslated, which essentially say because of the principle of national self-determination, socialists have to support the war aims of the Entente powers in order to protect plucky little Serbia and bleeding Belgium from the violations of the right of self-determination by the uh, the Germans. So that yes, he's uh, anti-war, but he's anti-war for the sake of being pro-entente, which is why he denounces the uh, Russian Revolution in the October, the Bolshevik of Israel power in October 1917, because it's knocking Russia out of the war. Um, 
and in 1918 to 21 and 1933 to 34, uh, the purely national perspective and the failure to grasp the structure of the capitalist state and the way in which capital rules through its state uh, leads to and the, the attempt to avoid civil war uh, leads to uh, not avoiding civil war, but having a one sided civil war run by the other side. Um, and in the end of the day, the price of the SPDs avoiding civil war, which they could have won in 1918 to 21, and the SPO, the Austrian Socialist Party, civil war they could have won in 1918 to 21, is the European War of 1939-45, that the, you're paying an enormously large cost uh, for uh, 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 pacifism as a it cost in lost lives for pacifism as a policy. Um, okay, so um, then my third point about the uh, uh, Second International is we enter into the war. Uh, a pro-war wing enters into coalition with the bourgeois state and uh, with the government and deploys police measures to suppress anti-war tendencies. Mm -hmm. It's not just, as I said, not just the traditional coalitionist and revisionist right. Um, in Germany, the de Glocker tendency um, led by uh, Parvus, Alexander Gelfand, a.k.a. Parvus, um, uh, uh, is a tendency which comes out of the far left of the German party. In France, uh, Jules Guest was uh, a centre uh, was was uh, part of the orthodox Marxist centre and on the hardline side of it. Uh, Guest was one of the guys who voted against admitting the British Labour Party on the grounds that it wasn't um, uh, a socialist party. In Italy, again, I referred to Arturo Labriola and Benito Mussolini become national nationalist socialists in support of the government's uh, war efforts. Uh, the result is there is a split in the international workers' movement, which is not undoable. Mm -hmm. uh, Fernando Claudan, um, Spanish Euro communist, argued that uh, the split in the workers' movement was in in uh, 1917 to 19, 1918 to 20 was uh, a sectarian split and that it was necessary to the workers movement to undo it but it turns out that actually the consequence of trying to undo it in the way in which Claudan and his co-thinkers did is not to uh, uh, unify one big tent unity of the workers movement but simply to prohibit uh, the anti-war elements, the anti-loyalist elements from speaking to silence the everybody except the uh, people who are loyal to the uh, to the state. Um, and we can see that in the evolution of, well, the PCE just destroyed itself pursuing that policy that what remains is so uh, very small scale. This is the Spanish Communist Party. Uh, the British Communist Party, yeah, they liquidated the organisation, uh, literally liquidated the organisation. And uh, the people who were Euro communists and Marxism today, uh, people uh, became about the, the most prominent of them became Blairites and uh, the uh, uh, Blairite um, progress organization has illustrated how strongly the roles ideas of Marxism today underlay the uh, Blairite pro-capitalist uh, government. Okay, so given that the split is un not undoable, that we can't return to the uh, Marxist movement of pre-1914, then uh, the book goes on to pose a series of questions, which are questions essentially, and I'm not going to go into any of them really in much detail at all, um, or go far far into any of them, of co the communist policy, because, of course, the Comintern, having the split having been made, the Comintern had to define what it thought about a whole series of 
uh, strategic questions. And the, the, the rest of the book is about those strategic questions which are posed by the Comintern and which are then appropriated by the modern far left, either a Maoist far left or Trotskyist far left. Um, uh, the question of the war itself and the policy of, quote, revolutionary defeatism and what it means. The ideology of the purifying split, because, of course, there was, I've said a split was necessary, but does the split splitting some of the things that the Comintern leadership said in 1918 to 21 suggested that splitting the movement would purify it. And the reality is that isn't the case. Uh, because we can see in the Bolshevik party itself and in the history of the communist movement uh, ever since, organisational separation is absolutely no guarantee against infection by uh, political opportunism. A recent example, um, uh, uh, the uh, um, Irish People Before Profit is a front organisation for the Irish uh, equivalent of the British Socialist Workers' Party. And it's been the view of the British Socialist Workers' Party ever since the late 1960s that the only way to avoid uh, opportunism is to maintain political opportunism, is to maintain rigorous organisational separation. OK, they've maintained rigorous organisational separation. But now, now, people before profit, which has managed to get uh, a, a, a couple, one or two elected representatives in the Irish Doyle, the Irish Parliament, is agitating for them to be able to participate in a coalition government with Sinn Féin, which is a uh, pro-capitalist, a nationalist party, but it's very unambiguously a capitalist party, a pro-capitalist party. Uh, and uh, not in any sense an organisation of the workers' movement. And if uh, it's unlikely that it will, it's very unlikely that it will actually happen in reality, probably Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael would go for a grand coalition among themselves rather than there being a... Uh, uh, and indeed, uh, Sinn Féin probably wouldn't be that interested in getting on board one or two people from people before profit. Um, but nonetheless, it's uh, 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 an example of uh, the collapse of the organised, separatist organised left into the uh, politics of right-wing coalitionism. We can actually see the same thing um, in the 1960s in the Sri Lankan Trotskyist Lanka Sama Samaja party. Um, absolutely proud of its independent character uh, collapsing into becoming part of a uh, left nationalist government. Um, secondly, um, so the ideology of the purifying split plainly doesn't work. The ideology of the party of a new type, uh, which is about um, organisational changes which the Bolshevik party made to their own party structure in the period 1918 to 1921 as a result of the exigencies of civil war, which they then offered as being a model for the whole world. And the, the result of that model for the whole world is parties which can play a significant role in mobilising the peasantry in peasant majority countries, uh, but uh, are in practice, uh, have a tendency to um, uh, destroy the local mediations between the party and the cl working class as a class, and therefore to be useless, uh, even in Latin American countries where you, 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 the, the, you've got a significant the urban working, any country you've got a significant urban working class and the class saliency of the issue of working class politics is important. Um, uh, thirdly, uh, the um, problem of unity and diversity. Once you've split the workers' movement, it's nonetheless the case that the workers' movement still needs unity. And the obvious case of that is trade unions. The, the idea that it's a good idea to have ideological separation between uh, communist trade unions and socialist trade unions, let alone between... Um, uh, 
communist trade unions and quote worker communist trade unions or uh, whatever the hell the different little grouplet uh trade unions it's just obvious to anybody working on the shop floor that that is a recipe for uh, um uh defeat and destruction sometimes you have to split trade unions uh but uh, the circumstances under which it's desirable to split trade unions is almost never um and similarly in in uh, we we split with the loyalists but of course the reality is that quite a lot of say for example uh, we want um uh wage rises that's actually a common position of people loyal people loyalist in loyalists in the trade union movement and um of leftists in the trade union movement there's a certain level of solidarity in the trade union movement and my own experience i was uh, in the middle 1970s either queer bashed or pabloite bashed by a um uh supporter of jerry healy's workers revolutionary party uh, and rescued by a bloke from the right wing of the trade union branch, which I was at the, 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 uh, at the county car factory where I was working at the time. You know, that that low level trade union solidarity is important, but that's also true of quite a lot of. And so the Communist Party, Communist International, came up with the policy of the United Front, which is that we're going to unite. Uh, around the stuff which is common positions between the uh, loyalist right wing and the communists, uh, but while retaining um, uh, open ideological debate uh, between the right wing and the communists. But it couldn't be made to work. And the reason why it couldn't be made to work is because the... Uh, Right on the one hand, the right wing, the whole point of the right, that what caused the split was the desire of the right wing to silence the communists, the people who became the communists, the non loyalist element. Mm -hmm. That was the point of it. But secondly, the other side of it was that um, it was impossible to persuade the large masses of the working class that the communists offered a democratic alternative to the loyalist right wing in circumstances where the communists were running this militarized top down dictatorship uh, invented in civil war conditions in uh, 1918 to 1921. And the consequence, therefore, was that the uh, United Front turned into either um, exposure, we call for unity, but we don't actually make any serious efforts to achieve unity, or alternatively self-silencing. Uh, in order We're desperate to achieve unity, and in, therefore we promise to self-silence. This was Georgi Dimitrov's argument at the 7th Congress of the Comintern um, in 1946. Uh, we, the, the the socialists complain that we, the communists criticise them. We will criticise nobody except for breaking the unity of the United Front. But of course, if you're going to criticise nobody except for breaking the unity of the United Front, why don't you just join the socialist parties? Mm -hmm. um, how do we... We need, the working class needs unity and diversity, you know, just as we don't need ideologically separate trade union organisations. You know, we need ways of organising unity and diversity. We dodge out from under that by uh, unprincipled exclusion of minorities, by uh, factitious disciplinary charges used to expel people we've got a whole load of that in the british labor party in recent years but also in a whole load of far left organizations all over the world we avoid it, unity by walking out and refusing unity in action unless uh, 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 ideological commitments are, are made which would uh, allow unity in action but also uh, we avoid uh, unity and diversity by self-censorship in order to achieve unity, by, by setting up unity on basis of a set of windy generalities which cover for what um, 
the uh, Lenin and later Trotsky called diplomatic formulae, which cover for the disagreements between us, so that we aren't actually admitting to the masses that we have disagreements between us, but we're pretending that we're it's all unity. Um, one, two, three, four, five, the workers' government slogan. Uh, I'm not going to say anything at length about that. I think it's just, it's useless. Um, or rather, it's useless, um, but it's useless in a, uh, a a way which is interesting. We'll come back in a minute. The, the sixth point is the question of international unity. And we've got this very peculiar history of ideological assertions of um, the need for international unity, but on the other hand, ideological assertions of national roads. It's clear that um, the working class needs international unity. It needs in order to think of itself, because capitalist production is organised internationally, in order to think of itself as a class for itself, the working class needs to think of itself as an international class. So that even a merely low-level symbolic international, and to a large extent, the first international and second international had that character of being symbolic internationals of symbols, you know, uh, can validate that self-perception of the working class as an international class. You know. Conversely, however, what we've actually got in the world today is not no internationals. Lots of people write, there is no international. We need a new international. They grantite uh, international Marxist tendency is just converting itself into the, quote, revolutionary communist international next month. Um, saying there is no international. But of course, actually, there is uh, the grantites, there is the international socialist tendency organized by the Socialist Workers' Party, there are international conferences of the official communist movement, there are at least two Maoist international organizations, uh, there is an international organization organized around uh, uh, calling itself the Fourth International Organized Out of Paris. There's another one calling itself something else organized out of Paris. There's at least two organized out of Buenos Aires, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is exactly the same thing of too many groups, too many internationals. So the positive orientation, which is argued by the book at the end of the day, uh, is in the first place uh, the idea of uh, that the workers' movement has to think in terms of the basic principles of Marxism, in terms of the working class taking power through the struggle for extreme democracy or the struggle for democratic republicanism. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, in that sense, the idea of democratic republicanism is the missing core. It's not that the democratic republic is the alternative and, and talk about nothing else. It's that it's the missing core. It's become missing because on the one hand, uh, in 1918, Katsky and Co. and the Social Democracy started calling the democratic republic what was in fact um a mixed constitution, oligarchical mixed constitution with a, a, a presidential monarchy, which uh, Frederick Engels in discussing France characterized as uh, the empire of 1799 without the emperor. So that what Kansky and Co were calling the Democratic Republic was uh, the Kaiser Reich without the Kaiser. Um, and actually that's closer to the truth than the Empire of 1799 without the Emperor. Um, uh, so that uh, that, on the one hand, guts the idea of the Democratic Republic. On the other hand, the Bolsheviks and the Comintern that abandoned the idea of the Democratic Republic as, it, as a sort of negative dialectical negation of this uh, a, approach of the right. Yeah. But the consequence of it is you lose any sense of uh, a political project for working class political power. And you need that sense, not because in order to do socialism, in order to do uh, economic planning, 
we need uh, democratic procedures, democratic decision making, decision processes. It's it it's it's not something which just disappears. And indeed, flip side of it, in order to make the workers' movement fit to fight, we need to demanagerialize the workers' movement. We need democratic procedures and decision processes in the workers' movement. Secondly, um, we need the project, the present project has to be not a project of government right now, not a project of uh, the general strike will issue in the creation of Soviets, which will issue in the creation of Soviet power, which was misunderstanding of what happened in 1905 and 1917, because the reality was that in 1905, the Mensheviks set up Soviets uh, because they wanted to, where it was, was the idea was to imitate the trades and labor councils, which had been growing up in Britain at the time. And guys came back from exile and said, hey, the British workers movement did these trades and labor councils. Neat idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and in 1917, it was the Mensheviks with the support of the Russian state uh, turning what had been uh, production committees for the support of the war into uh, Soviets. Um, but then that turned into something which had enough legitimacy that the Bolsheviks could win the elections. Um, so the, the idea that it just grew out of the strike movement is untrue. And strike movements have given rise to local forms of coordination of that sort over and over again, but not, nothing on no occasion without a political party backing it as it led to Soviet. So we need political party uh, projecting itself as a political voice for opposition in the interests of the working class, uh, not as the general staff of the revolution, not as um, the means of acquiring a government in the very short term, uh, but as an oppositional voice, and that oppositional voice then enables um, strengthening and developing uh, all the rest of the movement, the trade unions, the cooperatives, the um, uh, mutual funds and similar workers' educational operations and so on and so forth. It's that task uh, which uh, I argue in the book is the, ta the, the, the task which is presently posed, but which we are stuck with not pursuing because of the, the attachment of the left to um, uh, either coalitionism or street and strikeism. So that's it. Thanks very much. That covers uh, quite a lot. But... I'm just going to add a couple of questions because I know that the audience who will, uh, who will listen to this are interested in these subjects. Uh, for some of the people who've read the book, the, the way you put forward demands, democratic demands, in relation to revolutionary movements uh, is of interest. So the relationship between democratic demands and socialist demands, but also in general, the concept of fighting for democracy as of now, maybe, <laughs> both in terms of advanced capitalist states, but also uh, the audience here being the radio. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I, I the what I'm trying to one of the things which I'm trying to do is to break with, um, and indeed I've got an article in this week's Weekly Worker uh, about the nature of the minimum program. Yeah, is to break with the idea uh, that the bourgeoisie is a democratic class, and we and made the bourgeois democratic revolution, and that. Uh, raising democratic demands is about uh, completing the uncompleted uh, bourgeois democratic revolution. It, it, it isn't. Mm -hmm. uh, um, if we read the 
uh, French Revolution together with all the other revolutions, it's quite transparent that the capitalist class, the, yes, the capitalist class may raise democratic issues in order to mobilize the classes below it to overthrow the pre-existing feudal state. Mm -hmm. uh, but as soon as it's done that, then the question of uh, too much democracy raises its ugly head. Um, Mark Mulholland's book, uh, bourgeois liberty and the politics of fear uh, very usefully assembles all the evidence and it's already it's not a question that this is because in 1848 the bourgeoisie lost its nerve and this is evidence of the uh, it, uh, collapse uh, the decline of capitalism it's the um, it's already the uh, policy of the uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, British bourgeoisie in 1640 to 60, uh, as well as of the French bourgeoisie actually in uh, 1789 through uh, 1815. You know. um, so that uh, then the second question is, OK, so where does the democratic movement come from? And the answer is the democratic movement comes from the working class. OK, it comes from, in the first place, the, the democratic impulse for people like the levelers in the 1640s, 50s, comes from the petty bourgeoisie slash artisan and small farmer class. Um, but it's a petty bourgeoisie which is in process, in transition into being proletarianized. And indeed, by the end of the 17th century, um, uh, uh, at least 30% of the British population is wage dependent. Um, so that it, it, it's very easy to overestimate the extent to which uh, the petty bourgeois, the importance of the petty bourgeoisie as a class in um, early modern, early modern England. And in France, on the other hand, comes the, the movement comes from the urban, urban uh, petty bourgeoisie and working class, but the peasantry is not by any means democratic in France, but throws up uh, Bonapartism. Mm -hmm. So um, the point is the working class is a class in order to defend its interests has to act collectively. In order to act collectively, it needs uh, democratic forms of organization because it needs to mobilize itself. It's no good saying uh, we can... Um, uh, play with uh, the bourgeois media because, of course, the bourgeois media at the end of the day will support the bourgeoisie. Mm -hmm. So the democratic question is the question of workers' power. Now, that doesn't mean that there are no socialist demands that we say just, mm -hmm. because it's bloody obvious that there's a whole raft of stuff. The, the capitalism is in transition to socialism. It's already begun to be in transition to socialism in a deformed way um, uh, uh, under capitalist rule. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole raft of stuff which uh, can't be done on the basis of pure free market operations, the railways, the uh, uh, water supply infrastructure, the electricity supply infrastructure, blah, blah, blah. So that um, uh, uh, the idea that um, <clears throat> one can say, we, we, it, the question of political democracy is essential because without political democracy, the working class can't organize itself and without commit political democracy, the working class can't rule. And equally, without political democracy, as we could seen in the Soviet Union, the result of, uh, quote, planning, unquote, with no political democracy is that everybody tells lies in order to preserve their individual position. And so the plan, brilliant as the software may be, you garbage in, garbage out. You know, there is no trustworthy data because every manager lies in order to avoid losing his job. And the work workers, of course, uh, we get the, the story. They pretend to pay us and we pretend to work, uh, is the old Soviet joke. Mm -hmm. 
So you need political democracy for economic planning. You need political democracy. The working class needs political democracy in order to mobilize itself because these managerialist workers' organizations demobilize people at the base and in consequence they become hollowed out shells with large imposing membership but no practical ability to turn people out or alternatively they just collapse which quite often quite a lot of to the extent they have um so this is about the uh, political democracy is part of the necessities of the working class but it's also the case as i said there's a whole load of stuff but at the same time flip side of it we're not about uh, leaping straightforwardly into the kingdom of freedom um and we're not about uh, the working class is going to abolish the petty bourgeoisie uh, again soviet but not just Soviet, you know, Soviet, Chinese, Cuban, etc., testing of forced collectivization projects, it bloody doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So that uh, the minimum program is essential because we're not going to socialize everything. It's not going to be we take power and everything is instantaneously socialized. Um, so I, 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 is is that does that address the issue? You're muted. Yeah, others might ask more questions. Yeah, yeah, something. quite likely. Yeah. Uh, the other question was, and you have referred to this both in the book but elsewhere as well, the relationship between reform and revolution. Now, very often. We need to make more urgent demands that, on the surface at least, appear uh, advocating a form of reform. So I wanted you to address the, the issue of reform and revolution, especially in the light of some groups of the radical left gradually moving to what one could call strategic positions of reform, as opposed to making tactical demands that could be considered reformist. I'm not sure if I explained myself but... yeah okay this is this is this is um part of the uh, again the debate in the second international um and uh, it's sort of unhelpful and uh, the reason why it's unhelpful if we start with the process is a process of historical change. Mm -hmm. Processes of historical change involve processes of gradual change and processes of abrupt change. This is not a it's not particularly peculiar to history, frankly. It's also the case, you know, you you, you put uh, heat under a kettle and uh, uh, the water gradually heats up and heats up and then at a certain point, 100 degrees centigrade it turns into steam and uh, steam is a rather a different entity from hot water um uh animals die they gradually decay human beings as well animals plants gradually decay and then death comes and that's a different moment and so the processes of the process is always involved both the gradual and the abrupt. Mm -hmm. um, the question of revolution is posed in a slightly different way, which is to say uh, the abrupt process is the, the, the what, what's posed particularly is the question of the organized state. And the reason is because uh, the state Although we sometimes talk about the state as superstructural, it isn't. Uh, you can't have private property without public ways, uh, public 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 roads which are access access give access to it. You can't have private property without a legal order which enforces uh, whose property it is. Well, not a legal it doesn't have to be a legal order. It can be a cust legal or customary order. But the legal or customary order is a public thing. Mm -hmm. 
And the state, to the extent that it does the job, the state is an organized armed force backed by logistics apparatus and a taxing system, uh, which has sufficient control of a territory to be able to extract a share of the surplus product from that territory in the form of taxation. And so it's a, it's a sort of the state is a kind of protection racket. It only works as a protection racket to the extent that it actually provides some degree of protection. Because when it, when everybody recognizes the state as a protection racket, what you've got is Afghanistan in the last year of the American occupation or South Vietnam in 1974-75 or uh, the white territories in uh, uh, the uh, Civil War in Russia. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, in order to complete the process of transition from one mode of production to another, it's necessary that the old state order should be overthrown. Mm -hmm. And that's just as true of uh, the overthrow of the state orders of classical antiquity. Uh, you get uh, a new mode of production and social order developing as a result of the overthrow of the uh, Western Roman Empire and as a result of the overthrow of the uh, Sasanian regime. Um, but in uh, the Byzantine regime, the old order clings on and keeps reconstituting itself and re-establishing uh, uh, the uh, until finally the Ottomans knock it over. Mm -hmm. um, equally, the flip side of it, in England in 1688, uh, the uh, parliamentary opposition invites a Dutch invasion and uh, King Billy and his fleet and army come in and uh, the uh, leading generals in James II's army desert him and go over to King Billy. And uh, there are mass movements against Catholics in different parts of England. Um, and in fact, civil war in both Scotland and Ireland. Um, and uh, then, OK, uh, that's an event. But the consequence of that overthrow of the, 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 the Stuart state uh, is an extraordinarily rapid explosion of the London stock market, the invention of the Bank of England, corporate shares, uh, insurance companies. Uh, and um, Tim Harris, who's a historian of the period, has commented that uh, somebody who went to uh, a, a Rip Van Winkle who went to sleep in 1686 and woke up in 1716 would not recognize the society as the same society that he'd come from. Whereas there is a sense in which, OK, we would know if we were shut back into 1716, we would know that it's different from what it is now. But in many respects, it has the same characteristics. It's got and routine sittings of parliament. It's got, as I said, insurance companies, advertising agencies, public press, um, uh, 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 scams resulting from uh, uh, stories about new technology, um, the guys who were, uh, uh, the, the Jonathan Swift's uh, um, Gulliver's Travels is a sort of science fiction satire and uh, the um, uh, story of Laputa where there's endless projectors projecting, proposing new uh, tech which will Solve the world. We've got the, the hollow sword blade company who were going to make sword blades very cheap by making them hollow. Or um, there's a company to extract cooking oil from English radishes. Um, uh, there's companies to build machine guns and etc. A whole load of tech, which is sort of there's new tech, which is live and is actually going places like this use of steam engines to extract water from mines but there's also new tech which is fantasies um goodwin wharton the brother of one of the leading politicians was uh, involved in raising funds for a submarine to 
um, raised treasure from wrecked ships. They didn't have the tech to actually make a submarine. So on the, this, this in all of these senses, the the, the society after sixteen eighty eight is our society, mm. and it's that the, the that that sense of the 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 revolution. But the revolution is the question of the state, and the problem is the. Uh, reform or revolution speak talk of the far left is not in terms of the, the overthrow of the state. It doesn't matter whether the overthrow of the state happens um, uh, um, you know, God, the commune, Paris commune, they took over the uh, Parisian local government, which was the Parisian local government organization of the uh, of the Bonapartist regime before the commune broke up they emerged um uh the english revolution the first stage of the english revolution they took parliament the way in which they took parliament was they uh, um uh largely harassed the uh, upper section of the city the borough um, the, the boroughs which elected the mps and you got mass movements of intimidation uh, forcing the guys who would normally support the crown in the in all the boroughs to return oppositional MPs. Mm. Uh, in the Netherlands, um, uh, there was a uh, movement, and then there was a um, uh, there was a political development, but then there was repression by the Spanish state, and um, there was what we would now call prolonged people's war conducted by the sea beggars who were in effect pirates who subsequently seized Amsterdam and Rotterdam and thereby triggered the uh, territorial conquests. And so how you get to the overthrow of the state is not decisive, whereas the uh, reform or revolution guys say, no, we shouldn't be standing in elections. That's not the issue. It's the issue is how we get rid of the constitutional order and replace it with a constitutional order which is answerable to the working class, as opposed to the same way as the bourgeoisie had to get rid of the monarchist constitutional order, the Catholic constitutional order, and replace itself with a constitutional order which was answerable to the capitalist class. Is that helpful? Yes, that's very helpful. Um, my own last question is, um, the attraction of activism, obviously, especially for uh, young comrades, but also for everyone. There are movements that appear. There is the attraction of being involved in those activities. And obviously, we don't want to discourage people that. But I want to, uh, I want you to um, look at the connection between activism and strategy. So, how do we get involved in uh, various strikes, demonstrations, political events without losing sight of strategy? And I explain this to you in terms of Iran, for example, which I'm sure you follow to a certain extent. But the woman life freedom movement in Iran led to a lot of activism amongst the left as well as the right, but amongst the left as well. And at times it appeared as if that activism had created a, a, a way with which the left, which basically sank the left. The left was following that way to such an extent that it got lost in it, lost any principles, lost a strategic view, why are we involved in this movement? We are not involved in this movement simply on the issue of hijab. We are fully, we have other ambitions. But activism has the danger of creating a situation where the left is submerged in what is going on. How can we combine the two without losing track of both our principles, but also strategy. OK, I think the answer to this one is the question of political voice. 
Yeah. Uh, it's fine to be doing activism and to be involved in activism, uh, but it's not fine to be doing activism and involved in activism to the extent that that involves you sacrificing having a political voice. Uh, uh, because if you sac if you sacrifice your having a political voice, there will be a political voice, but the political voice of the activism will take the form of whatever the uh, our rulers choose to be. Uh, so women, life, freedom, as far as I can see, you wind up with actually the dominance of US sponsored, indirectly US, very indirectly US sponsored uh, ideas of uh, uh, what the alternative uh, to the regime is. Yeah. Um, so what do you need for political voice? Uh, in the first place, actually, it's it's press. Mm. Um, and um, it's press of a sort which is actually posing uh, the question in and out of the moments of activity. So we can't do this. It, it, we, we CPGB, we don't have enough forces to be able to do this. But an effective press is going to be actually talking about the hijab and gender issues and so on and so forth when there's nothing going on as well as when there's something going on um or indeed i mean it, it, it was trivial bloody level when i was in my 20s we used to put out a weekly bulletin at the cowley car plant everybody took it basically everybody took it because uh we'd got guys inside the plant who were feeding giving us information about for the writing of the bulletin about what was happening uh, in terms of a low level of somebody X is being victimized, there's a strike about that, the management are doing this, what's going on with the uh, state of the company. We had some economists working for us to analyze the uh, company's uh, financial returns. And the result was we, there was an informative, but it was also a bulletin uh, which uh, at the back, so it was uh, just four pages of, uh, A5 in the form of a, an A4 sheet on its side, folded, produced on a uh, cycle style, the old style, Ronio duplicate, <laughs> old tech. Um, uh, uh, the back page was something taken from our national, either usually something taken from our national paper about uh, the war in Ireland or about. Um, uh, one of the first pieces I wrote was about the victimization of a gay teacher. And we were a bit uneasy in the 1970s about whether that was going to create antagonism among the readers. It turned out, no, it, readers were fine with that. They weren't so fine with my using bad language in my article. Um, they, but a really effectively functioning um Workers' Party would have a uh, a central organ of one sort or another, but all sorts of local organs like these factory bulletins, like uh, local papers of one sort or another. We had in the 70s quite a lot of local papers um, produced on very low tech operations of one, local left press of one sort or another produced on very low tech operations and the central paper ties the staff together and um the uh, german spd was illegal between oh god 1879 and 1890 1878 and 1890 uh, they produced a newspaper in switzerland and smuggled it into germany yeah. The, the, the the Russian Social Democrats, similarly, they produced a newspaper in um, Switzerland or London, wherever the case was, uh, and uh, smuggled it into Russia. And it was for that purpose that they talk about the need for conspir conspiratorial, the techniques of conspiracy. It's the techniques of conspiracy just to get the press into the country. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the problem is, in order to do that, and this is the problem with the far left, that, that the far left, because the far left splits and splits and splits and splits and splits, 
it can't uh, actually do that work. It can't have that voice. And everybody imagines that if we grab hold of, we, our little group, grabs hold of the mass movement, that grab, by grabbing hold of the mass movement, we will overtake all the others and have, they won't. They will have to accept that we're the, you know, the guys. Um, uh, but the result is actually that they silence themselves in order to um, uh, grab onto the mass movement as a tail. And there's a sense in which it's almost, it quite often it actually works like that you're grabbing the cat's tail and the cat turns around and scratches you. Uh, that uh, people get pissed off with the left grabbing hold of their movement when the left isn't permanently there and it's this voice question but similarly okay iran i think it's probably utterly impossible to uh, do electoral work because of the council of guardians control of who can stand as candidates i don't know if that's as, as true in local what what the arrangements for local government are uh the the uh the the russians and for that matter, the Germans uh, in their periods of illegality had various sorts of uh, weird devices to enable them to get just the thin end of a wedge into the electoral arrangements. Didn't get very far with it, but it was the point was not to win a government. The point was to be a political voice. And similarly, um that, I think, is the point of uh, electoral interventions of the left, wherever it's possible. Um, is that helpful? Thank you very much. That covers everything I have to ask. I'm going to end this bit, um, just the recording here.